Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the uh, first Bluegrass Forever Green Sustainability Summit. Uh, I'm Bobby Clark, uh, going to be your Master of Ceremonies today. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for coming out for this, uh, what I consider a historic event uh, of uh, marshalling the forces and activists in uh, central Kentucky and really around the state, some of the speakers that have come here uh, today. Um, this uh, idea uh, has evolved. Uh, I am on the board of Bluegrass Tomorrow. I have served for three years as the chair of the Green Vision Committee. And earlier this year, Bluegrass Tomorrow, which is celebrating its 25th year, uh, had a strategic planning session to see what the next 25 years were going to be like and how we should structure the organization and uh, for, for the coming uh, 25 years and beyond. Uh, and uh, I walked up to some of the other committee members after that strategic planning and says, we need to do the same thing with Green Vision. Where are we going? What are we doing? We had previously reached out to Franklin County, mm -hmm. Scott County, and Jessamine County, mm -hmm. and some activities were going on, but it was all dependent on the locals of that particular community of whether or not we proceeded in one direction or, or the other. And uh, so we felt, uh, the committee felt, and got together and says, let's do something different. We had heard about uh, the uh, Louisville Sustainability Council. We had heard about the green umbrella up in Cincinnati and you'll hear from both of those folks uh, uh, here in a, in a few minutes and said maybe we should do something like that. And um, so uh, to tell you just a little bit about how I got into this uh, adventure on uh, sustainability is uh, I am co-founder of Midwest Clean Energy Enterprise a clean and renewable energy company. Uh, my business partner, Jason DeLam, is on the program and will speak a little later about one of the programs that we're doing. Uh, but my introduction to sustainability, other than a little recycling at home, uh, was through uh, Sustainable Business Ventures, a 501c3 nonprofit that we started. And I had the opportunity uh, in uh, 2009 to tap some federal stimulus funds through two workforce investment boards in Kentucky. And at the time, one of the criteria was to look at green. I really didn't know what green was at the time, other than what I'd read or heard uh, on the news or on different programmings. And I got into it. I became uh, you know, very uh, uh, active, very uh, committed to seeing what I can do, not only for my family and my 16-year-old daughter, uh, but the more people I talked, about, uh, talked to about this, is there was a growing, a growing movement going on and uh, so one of the things that uh, uh, we uh, uh, did was developed a green entrepreneur program to work with these youth. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's kind of how we, I got here today. Uh, there's a whole lot more to that story. Uh, but I want to thank uh, our committee members on the Bluegrass uh, Tomorrow's uh, committee, uh, Amy Soner, uh, Nelson Maynard, who was on vacation this week, and we picked the date. Uh, he'd already set his vacation plans. Uh, Cindy Dietz, uh, Blaine Early, and Rob Rumkey. Is Rob here? Uh, Rob's over at the Bluegrass Higher Education uh, Consortium meeting uh, at this point, and we have a great deal of thanks to Rob, who has helped shepherd this organization, I don't know how many years now, but a number of years, to keep Bluegrass Tomorrow going, growing, and accomplishing its uh, original mission. I also want to thank uh, Stites and Harbison, uh, Blaine Early. Uh, their firm is the presenting sponsor uh, for this uh, this event. And uh, Florence, did you get the PowerPoint? Uh, let's see the main summit PowerPoint up there, if you would. We had some technical difficulties on the early stages of the thing. Um, so this recognizes Bluegrass Tomorrow and uh, uh, the like. And then um, I also want to say, how did we get here? Uh, Bluegrass Tomorrow, Rob came up with Bluegrass Forever Green. They're very synergistic wording, but also a way to begin to define what we think this movement, what this initiative we believe is going to grow into, uh, and came up with the name Bluegrass Forever Green uh, for the next 25 years of our organization. Now, what do we want to accomplish today? Uh, our goals, we wanted to share best practices, focusing on maximizing the collective impact, and I'm going to talk about collective impact in just a moment, of regional government organizations, organizations, nonprofit and otherwise, uh, educational institution, 
businesses, and individuals. Individuals with a passion to try to make a difference uh, in our world. And the quality of life and economic development is our goal at the end of this, this process that we really won't end, it's just beginning. Uh, our focus, our focus today uh, and beyond will be on local foods, clean water, energy, outdoor recreation, green spaces, waste and recycling, and transportation. There may be more. Part of today is not to just sit up here and tell you what we want you to do. Most of today is to aggregate everybody together to start having a conversation about what we need to do and need to do together. Uh, at the center of all this, and uh, Rob mentioned a few minutes ago at the uh, Vision Awards, is that at the center of all of this, sustainability in the bluegrass region is unique to the rest of the world because of our precious bluegrass soils. So what Bluegrass Tomorrow has been doing all along seems like this is just a, a, a logical next step of where we need to go. I learned a, a phrase or a characterization a couple of years ago uh, that I thought was pertinent uh, as a prelude to what we're doing today. It's called Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability, or LOHAS. And what we found is that currently the marketplace, the U.S. marketplace for LOHAS, individuals that have lifestyles and focus on health and sustainability, is a $290 billion a year market. And there's goods and services that are focused on health and environment, social justice, uh, personal development and sustainable living. Uh, the consumers attracted to this market actually makes up about 13 to 19 percent of the adults in the United States. This doesn't talk about all the young people today that are actually leading the charge and the passion towards making a difference because it's their families in the future that are going to be impacted by the decisions we make or don't make uh, in the coming years. Um, and uh, so with that, I, uh, if you switch to collective impact, the next slide Florence. Um, just, uh, yeah, she's going to call up a uh, collective impact is a commitment of a group of people uh, to uh, different sectors for a common agenda of solving complex social problems. Now I have a two minute video that I think does it even better than I and then I'll walk through uh, the elements of that. Bear with us. You may have to just go to the desktop and go to the desktop. And it's the What Is Collective. Collective Impact organizations coming together to solve a complex social problem. Traditionally, nonprofits have operated in isolation from one another, pursuing their goals independently. But complex, large-scale problems require a coordinated, structured, and collaborative approach. Collective impact means creating alignment commitment, policy, funding, trust, and coordinating across sectors, public, nonprofits, business, governments, foundations. Collective impact efforts typically have five conditions. Common agenda. This means all parties agree to shared goals and how to get there. Shared measurement. Keeping track of the same things. Mutually reinforcing activities. Each actor doing their own part using their unique skills. Continuous communication. Regularly sharing results with each other. Backbone organization. A support team that helps mobilize, coordinate, and facilitate to keep the goal in sight and the progress rolling. Channeling our collective strength, we can solve the world's toughest problems. Collective impact. organizations coming together to solve a complex social problem. So I heard the word collective impact three times in a week from three different places. 
So obviously it was something I needed to learn about and after learning more about how it works and you'll hear probably more from uh, Louisville Sustainability Council and the Green Umbrella folks, this is a core uh, process. But as the video said, if you've got a common agenda, why not work, work together? Uh, if you, and, and it's very important, again you may hear more, we'll talk about it later, about shared measurement. You really need whatever it is you do as an organization. Or, or collaborating with other organizations is you need a process to measure what you're accomplishing. Not just mission and we're getting it done, but how do you quantify that? That helps keep an organization on point, that it's focusing on the things that make a difference, that really get to the core of the organization. Uh, mutually reinforcing activities. If five or ten or twenty different organizations in Central Kentucky are doing similar things, there's benefits from them organizing together. Uh, continuous communication. Again, letting every other group know, but more importantly, getting those other groups engaged in what you're doing so that the collective impact is maximized. And then some kind of back, uh, backbone support organization, which is one of the things that we're proposing, but we're not dictating. Today is about having a discussion. It, is there a need for another entity uh, under Bluegrass Tomorrow that w some of our planners thought it was, but we don't want to prejudge that today. We want to see what you all think. And after our presentations today, uh, we'll have about 30 minutes, uh, and I've got three questions that I've put on your table that we want each of your, your tables to answer and pick someone to uh, report that out for us uh, at the end of the presentation. So, with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Amy Soner at uh, Bluegrass Green Source. Alright, thank you so much Bobby and thank you all for coming. We weren't sure how many people that we would have and we said it would work with 20 and we're very happy with all of you. This is much more than 20 and so I said to somebody earlier that 100 would scare me. So this is, this is great. <laughs> this is between there. Um, I work with Bluegrass Green Source. We have been around since 2001 and our goal is to help, um, like it says up there, small changes and, and big impact. Help people understand that there are small changes that you can do in your own lives that can have a big impact on our, on our local environment. And this is something that's been very important to me. We serve um, a, a, a regional area and we've done things on a regional basis, we've done things on a local basis, and it's something that this is really good, this is, this is um, straight at my heart, is trying to get all of our region together. A lot of times we do a lot of work in Lexington and a lot of people think of us only as a Lexington organization. And those of you who don't know us or know us only in Lexington, I hope that you'll learn things today about what we do and how we try and get the whole region together. One of the things I was talking to, um, we have a good relationship with a lot of the people at LFECG here in Lexington, and one of the things I was telling them <clears throat> when I was talking about this summit was that Lexington has a lot to give. And one of the things that they, when we signed a contract with them a few years ago, one of the things they said to us was, anything you do when you create some of the programs you're creating for the city, take to the region. We want to be a beacon, a model for the, for the rest of the region that may not have the resources to implement the Live Green Lexington Partners Program, things like that. And I, that's one of the best things that Lexington ever said to me in the beginning, because it empowered us to take this message to the whole region. I also think that Lexington can learn a lot from you all because you all are doing things with less money, with more grassroots, with different partnerships, and so I really am excited to see the synergies from all the people um, in, in, throughout the whole region. Do you mind? So I isolated this because I wanted to once again just sort of mention what Bluegrass Green Source does. Our mission is to help people understand that small changes can have big impacts. And this means we aren't out in Frankfurt, we aren't talking to policy, we're not in DC, we're not doing things that change big giant policy, we're t changing things that affect you and your neighbor. And I think that that's very important and it makes us stand out, it helps us serve a niche that we don't get to, that nobody else is serving at the moment. Um, so, what is it that we do? Um, we, you know, small changes, big impact, but how do we do that? We do that through a variety of things. Um, we do environmental education. A lot of people know us through our K-12 through programs. We work with colleges, we work with preschools, we work with everybody to help them understand whether it's about water issues or energy issues or getting kids outside and just being outside instead of in the classroom. Those are the, things, the sort of education programs we do. 
Outreach I use to sort of define an, uh, adult education. And so we have rain barrel workshops and rain garden workshops and we do energy efficiency things and we have a website with resources. We changed our name from Bluegrass Pride to Bluegrass Green Source last year because we are the source for things to learn about, about green initiatives in Central Kentucky. So if you want to know how to make your house more energy efficient, you go to bggreensource.org and you can find information there to do it because we are the source for that. And then events. We do lots of events. We get kids out cleaning up trash. We do you know, all sorts of things event-wise as well. Um, we do tabling to, again, to sort of spread the environmental education message. This is the service area we serve. And, and the reason that we serve these 19 counties is because it's easy to drive to, easy-ish to drive to. Um, it, we can do anything anywhere, but we like to concentrate. We like to make sure that we can easily access the areas that we can get to and we can do hands-on stuff. So we, this is our region. Um, we have done things statewide. We've done things outside of these communities, but this is the area that we concentrate on. So why do we need a regional sustainability initiative? Last year, or this year, the Kentucky Environmental Education Council released the results of their every five year uh, education survey. This is a statewide survey of all of the, they do it count, you know, statewide, 120 counties. They ask a series of questions, they ask the same questions year after year so you can sort of judge changes. And I love this survey. This is something we helped them participate in in 2009 in some of our counties, but this is about this, this is the statewide information for just this year that just got released. So some of the questions that they asked and some of the questions that, and the responses that came back should empower us to understand that our message can be spread throughout the region in a way that affects everybody and not just the tree huggers and the, and the environmental people. Um, so the, one of the questions they asked was, uh, about econo economy and the environment. And 93% of the Kentuckians, this was done by I think the UK Survey Research Center or, or a very established research center, 93% of Kentuckians said that they either totally agree or somewhat agree with this statement, which is that it's possible to protect our environment and our economy. This is great news because people, you know, everything you hear, it's obviously an election season if you didn't know, everything you hear is about economy and, you know, coal and money, you know, and all of this. You, it, they are not mutually exclusive. You can have both at the same time. And it's not me telling you that. It's 93% of your peers that are telling you that as well. Um, so what did the survey say that, uh, that the, the number one environmental problem was in Kentucky? Water pollution and water quality. Uh, and I thought this was really interesting because we every day affect our water pollution and our water quality. And I think this is important because we need to make that connection regionally. Everything, if you're talking about air, if you're talking about getting kids outside, if you're talking about energy, it all affects water in some way. And I thought this was very telling that the most important environmental issue that Kentuckians thought was water quality um, and something that we work on. Environmental education, this is a little bit dear to my heart. I feel like what we do is environmental education, whether we're talking to K through 12 kids or adults, but 96% uh, of Kentuckians thought there was value in environmental education. Again, when you hear media and you talk and you hear you know, sort of bad things about the environment, this shows you that regionally, statewide, everywhere, we want environmental education. So in 2012, we teamed up with the Bluegrass Area Development District and the Appalachian Regional Commission and did a survey of environmental issues and attitudes in, our, in the eight counties that we have that correlate with the Appalachian Regional Commission. So they're highlighted there. If you're not a, familiar with the counties, you can see me later and, and I'll tell you what they are. But we wanted to, we created a series of public involvement meetings where we got stakeholders in each of the counties to talk about what their environmental issues were. We did a survey, an online survey, where we got people to under, you know, to write down what their, their uh, the problems they saw in their community were. So these, I'm going to talk about a few of the results from those, just those nine counties, but it's an interesting nine counties. They're sort of the eastern region, the Appalachian region. And I think a lot of what they said we can learn from as well. So I'm sure you cannot see this, and I knew that when I put it on the slide, but I wanted pretty colors for you. Um, <laughs> regional environmental quality. They said, you can see that it, uh, it goes poor, fair, good, and excellent. Nobody said our, our environmental quality was excellent. Everything became, whether this top is air, water quality, soil quality, solid waste services, industrial waste, natural resource, environmental education, overall rating. All of those fell between fair and good. So we have the ability to move forward. There is a there is movement that we can do to move that line put further to the right, to get more towards that excellent rating. 
Now, this is what I found most interesting, the top 10 regional concerns. Again, remember, this is only nine counties. We're talking here about a much broader central Kentucky. But these nine counties, num the number one and number two were about litter. One was litter, all the way the orange, the top orange bar at, over there, litter. Litter was their top concern. And then the second one there is illegal dumping. So I, I sort of combine those because I think that there's a lot of the same reasons that, ha that both of those happen. But anyway, you can see far beyond everybody else, all the other topics there, including, since you can't read it, stormwater runoff, soil erosion, residential flooding, clean water, herbicides, fertilizers, invasive species, and flood contamination. But far beyond all of those, litter and illegal dumping were some of the main things that those communities were concerned about. So how are we, how is Bluegrass Green Source, we did this uh, survey two years ago, how are we addressing these concerns, especially on a regional basis? We do a couple things. This was the first year we did this, this, this year, 2014. We called it the Main Street Clean Sweep. And it was a place where we got seven communities and we went downtown and in their community and we got uh, local volunteers to come and clean up their main street. And we made these beautiful t-shirts, one of our staff designed those, and we gave them out and we gave litter pickers and this was on Earth Day. And this was really exciting to us because it was in seven communities. Lexington has a downtown trash bash that we helped with as well, which is sort of where we got the idea. But this was a concerted effort, everybody all in one day and seven communities doing this and next year it's going to be even bigger so look for it in your community and, and just as a, as a, a, a something to look for Okay, we also report litter bugs. We do this in all of our 19 counties. Go to our website, bggreensource.org, and you can report a litter bug. They get a letter from a law enforcement officer and uh, we, they send it out. So that's one way that we can also report. We do a lot of cleanups. This is something, you know, if you get kids to clean up litter, they probably aren't going to litter when they're older. We just have to reach the adults, too. And the, the adults that participate in litter cleanups don't usually litter, but the litterers don't usually participate in our cleanups. So that's a little bit of an yeah, incongruity. But anyway, we do a lot of cleanups, too. So um, here's some other things that we do in the region that are regional. We have a rain garden program. That's a picture of a rain garden up in Lexington. Uh, we do a rain garden program that's a regional. We do rain barrel workshops thanks to Kentucky American Water throughout the area. We do a lot of storm drain stenciling. We do a lot of K-12 education as well. I'm trying to hurry because Bobby's telling me I'm done. Rain barrels. We put rain barrel. We have decorated rain barrels. We've been doing this program for a long time, and a lot of people know about us because of this. But we put decorated rain barrels throughout the community. We um, and then we have them all together, and we auction them off. And stay tuned for next year because we're going to do it even bigger and better, and it's going to be in May, and it's going to be very fabulous. Um, other regional initiatives that we have. We have a, a county liaison in each of the 19 counties that we serve. These people are there to help us understand the needs of the community because we live, we work in Lexington and we don't maybe know what's happening in Powell County or in Clark County. And so we need help from those people to help us understand the regional initiatives. We do teacher trainings for every teacher in, or that is open to every teacher in our region. This was a picture of taking them down into a deep coal mine to teach them about energy, where our energy comes from. We have a green jobs program program that's region-wide. We have green groups. This is something that's great. It meets quarterly at McConnell Springs and we talk about what everybody's doing just as a way to make sure that we're all on the same page and see if there's synergies that we can have. I'm almost finished. Okay. Um, so what's coming soon, right? What are we doing to do regional things? We are going to create a teacher advisory council. We right now have these county liaisons. We need a teacher advisory council because right now teachers can't serve as our liaison because they have school and can't get away. So we want people, we want summertime, we meet with them. They tell us what, what the new next generation science standards needs, what the needs are of teachers so that we can help them teach what they already teach in a way that is using the environment. Um, we have robust volunteer coordination. We have somebody on our staff who's taking that on. So if you have a volunteer need in your community and you want a zero waste event, you call us and we'll help you get volunteers for that. Um, zero, I already said that. Bluegrass Green 101. This is something that I want to do. It's not eminent, but I want to do it. I want to get volunteers and people who are interested in what's happening together to meet every Saturday for three or four weeks in a row and learn about where our waste goes, learn about how to save energy, learn what our region is doing to address all of these issues. And then the last one, is we are going to build a new building soon. And so this is a, a model of something that we're going to build. This is going to be an ecotourism destination. This is in the maybe five year plan, but this is what we want to do and have it a, a place for environmental education. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. A very good presentation.
Uh, now I'm excited uh, to move to our next uh, speaker, uh, Brent Fryer at the Louisville Sustainability Council in partnership for Green City. Uh, Jason and I uh, got involved in Louisville uh, a couple of years ago looking at the establishment of an eco district in the Nulu business area. We had 40 or 50 business uh, or meetings with different stakeholders in the community and learned that there was a whole lot going on in sustainability in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and Brent was one of the people that we met early on in, in the process. But as we, uh, six months after this process, we actually had a stakeholders meeting come together and some people had not even met each other yet in a city uh, like Louisville doing great work together. So Brent's here to tell you about the Louisville Sustainability Council and the partnership for Green City. I didn't do a PowerPoint because it was just going to be pointless to try to get everything that I can get across in 10 minutes on slides. The Partnership for a Green City is four partners, public partners, the City of Louisville, University of Louisville, the Jefferson County Public Schools and Jefferson Community and Technical College. We've been working together for the last 10 years on sustainability initiatives across public partners. Just to give you some perspective, we've got 30,000 employees, 138,000 students, 531 buildings. We manage 25,135 acres of land in Jefferson County, which is one-tenth of all the land in the county. In our buildings, we have 30 million square feet of space, and we spend $46 million a year for utilities. That's $3 million down from what we were spending because it had been increasing at 5 to 7% per year. We've shaved off $3 million both of our last two years in energy cost. Let me give you another number. Last year alone, we shaved, 100, or we shaved 33 million kilowatt hours off of our bills. Over three years, it's 101 million kilowatt hours. This is people working together. It's collective impact. It's people sitting around a table figuring out ways that we can do things better together than we can alone. And so if I don't bring any other point to you all, get together, find the synergy, and look at what you can do because it is impressive when you look at it on a scale. People will say, my little, my small impact doesn't make any difference, but it really does. 101 ki million kilowatt hours would light 9,400 average Kentucky homes for one year. So we're making an impact. We've got teams that work on green buildings, green transportation, green purchasing. We purchase together. We've got purchasing contracts on 10% or 30% post-consumer recycled content paper. We buy over a half million cartons of paper in any given year. So, I mean, purchasing together, we're saving $150,000, $200,000 a year just by purchasing paper together. Uh, we've got a containerized waste disposal contract that's a joint purchasing contract. We've got a uh, recycling contract that is moving towards the zero waste. Uh, Louisville's been real lucky. We've got a lot of competition with our hazardous materials or total materials vendors. Whether it's commercial wet dry, or whether it's single stream recycling, we've got people battling to really be the ones that are taking it away from us. So it's working that initiative. Uh, total materials management is one of our teams. They've been very active. We've really shifted from an environmental education focus to one of behavior change. It, with three educational institutions, our education will always be important. But if we don't ask people to make changes, then we're not doing our jobs. And one change that I can tell you, everybody in here, their mother told you at some point, turn off the lights. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. We can all turn off the lights, you know, we can all recycle, and we can all be idle free. That's three very quick little things that we can do to be green. So that's the partnership for Green City. We're doing urban heat island. We're doing uh, climate instability. I'm trying to think of what the seventh team is. And it's just gone somewhere over there. I've got a brochures in the back. Uh, be glad to share those with you all. And I'll stick around to talk with you all for a little while. 
Part of what the partnership did was work with the City of Louisville, the Bingham Fellows, which is a leadership group in Louisville, uh, and I can't think of the, there's an activist group, uh, Neighborhood Association, uh, Colleen, help me out. Anyway, we got together and decided there needed to be a group that was past the public partners. And so we've put together the Louisville Sustainability Council. The Louisville Sustainability Council is a 501c3, and it's public, private, nonprofits, activist groups, uh, neighborhood groups, anybody that's interested in sustainability, we're trying to pull them together as members of the LSC, not to duplicate efforts, not to take over. I mean, it was one of the first things that somebody said, you know, who died and made you king? Well, we're not trying to be king of anything, but if you think about, uh, and you're going to hear about the green umbrella, we talked about an umbrella organization where everybody fit underneath the umbrella and you can connect, engage, and convene people that are doing similar work because the collective impact model bringing people together around the different issues to achieve real change. So LSC is probably three years old. I roll off of the board at the end of this year. I've spent three years on their board of directors. We're just getting to the point where it's a real interesting place to be because We've got an executive director, we're fundraising, we've got five different uh, community action teams around green buildings and infrastructure, green economy, transportation, tree canopy and urban heat island effect, and community engagement. This group is the one in Louisville that is co-sponsoring something like this. So if you have a sustainability summit, the Louisville Sustainability Council is gonna be in there, the Partnership for Green City is gonna be in there, and the Louisville Office for Sustainability is gonna be in there. If there's anything that we can do to help any of you all down here, don't hesitate to call. Um, all my contact information is in the brochure back there. It's a real quick nail sketch of what we do, who we are. We're not that far away, and red and blue can get along. I mean, <laughs> obviously. So thank you for your time. Thank you. When I uh, contacted Emily Chandler to tell her what uh, she's the uh, acting executive director of LSC, told her about what we were doing, she got very excited because the issues facing Central Kentucky and Louisville area and Northern Kentucky are all all the same, and we can get some value from the collective impact of these three organizational uh, organizations, uh, regional organizations working together. Uh, I learned about the Green Umbrella soon after getting involved uh, in LSC. They had their first summit in Louisville in January at the zoo, and about 175 people, uh, including the mayor, uh, participated actively in uh, in that summit. And I heard about the Green Umbrella and and uh, was uh, pleased with the opportunity to go to their summit, I think it was in May of this year, uh, earlier this year, and they had 375 people. Now they're about four years old, where LSC is about a year old, uh, but there's a lot of really cool things happening, and uh, uh, we're really here today, because when I talked to Bill Shire, our next speaker, uh, he shared with me how they got started, and I thought the model uh, that they had followed uh, worked well, and again, that's why we're here today. Bill? He's also with uh, Vision 2015, a group, uh, let him tell you about Vision 2015, but it's very similar to the structure of uh, Bluegrass Tomorrow. Thanks, Bobby. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, the, um, I'll tell you a little bit about Vision 2015 first. Uh, Northern Kentucky has been doing community, uh, multi-county community visioning and community development since the 1980s. And in our second um, plan in 1995 called the Quest Vision Project, um, and I won't go into detail about all the elements of all those plans, but I'll focus on sustainability. In that plan in 1995, it was identified and called out to the community that we needed more public green space. So that was the statement about the environment uh, at that time. Um, we got some more, and so we made some progress, but in 2005, when uh, we did the next update of the community vision, uh, and it was a project called Vision 2015, a 10-year plan, um, that concept expanded a bit, and we got support, and the community called out that they wanted more of a, a network of connected trails and uh, parks and green spaces 
and transportation quarters. In addition to that, there was a specific project called the Licking River Greenway and Trails, uh, which is an urban trail system that was identified. Um, unfortunately, on the uh, networked system across the entire region, we ran into a buzzsaw of conflict. Uh, the Tea Party in Northern Kentucky uh, just was up in arms about the fact that anybody would spend money on trails and greenways and that type of thing. So that was a bit of a setback. So we didn't make as much progress as we wanted to, but there were a number of projects that were built and developed. Uh, the Licking River Greenway and Trails project, however, became a signature project, and we made a lot of um, progress on that. Uh, it runs from the mouth of the um, Ohio and Licking Rivers uh, south to uh, the I-275 Beltway. So we've got multiple communities working together. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that made that so successful so far is we've had nearly 3,000 hours of community volunteer work on uh, clearing um, honeysuckle and clearing debris and working on the paths and trailways. We've brought uh, Northern Kentucky University uh, together as well as the governments. And um, so anyway, that's made some good progress. Jumping forward to 2015, um, we are currently in the process of developing the next community vision. Um, and um, and these, these vision plans really are multifocal, uh, so not just sustainability. Uh, they generally focus on education, uh, economic competitiveness, livable communities in general, um, regional governance and regional stewardship, and a complex of issues that will help move the community forward. In uh, the current plan, though, we're finding a lot of support across the entire community, again, for trails and greenways and a connected network type system. So I'm sure that that's going to move forward another step in this next iteration of the plan. But as you can see, moving things across an entire community is a long process. So 1995 to 2015, a 20-year period of time, we've made certainly some progress, but we still have a lot of progress to, to be made. One thing I want to talk about in particular, however, is um, Green Umbrella. Uh, Green Umbrella is an interesting organization. It um, is the tri-state, the Greater Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky, Southeast Indiana, tri-state sustainability practices organization. And how it came into being was this. It's been around since about 2000. It was a very small uh, land conservation and environmental education uh, organization. It had about 10 organizational members and probably about 20 or 25 individual members, maybe a little bit more. Um, struggle for traction. The um, the Greater Cincinnati Foundation, which is our community foundation in Greater Cincinnati, um, and I, I'm going to tell this story to show what a single policy decision, what effect that can have. Uh, GCF, a number of years ago, began to tell applicants for grants that they needed to show how they connected to Vision 2015, the regional plan in um, Northern Kentucky, and Agenda 360, uh, the com comparable regional plan in Cincinnati, Southwest Ohio. So Green Umbrella went to Greater Cincinnati Foundation for a capacity building grant. Uh, they were told they had to figure out how they hooked up with us. And so they contacted us and we met to talk about their, their program and what they wanted to get accomplished. And sort of serendipitously, um, I, I had been noticing that we had lots of good green projects going in Northern Kentucky. But what was fascinating to me, and this is going to get to collective impact in a second, what was fascinating to me was that hardly any of the people running these green initiatives knew what the the other green initiatives were all about and what was being accomplished and who was doing what. So we had this kind of energy around green and sustainability, but it wasn't being linked and, and aligned and focused. So I've been trying to figure out, just from a Vision 2015 standpoint, how, how could we fix that and make it better? Uh, so then Green Umbrella comes out. And so we said to them, uh, Mary Steigerman from Agenda 360 and me from Vision 2015 said we were definitely in support of your program. However, we got a, a bigger and better idea for you. What if Green Umbrella would become the regional um, uh, sustainability practices organization instead of focusing only on land conservation and environmental education, become the sustainability practices program for the entire region? Because we said if nothing else, you guys got a great name green umbrella. And so everybody could fit underneath that umbrella. They said, you know, we'd love to do that. We don't know how to do it, but if you'd work with us, we'll be happy to do it. So we set about uh, Vision 2015, Agenda 360, and Green Umbrella, working to try to get that umbrella opened up. So we had our first summit about four years ago, and it was really very, very similar to this summit. Uh, we had three speakers in, uh, someone from Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Kansas City, because all three of those communities had uh, 
larger regional sustainability efforts in place. So we heard what they were doing. The second half of the meeting was spent at small table discussion talking about, well, should we try to do something similar to this in greater Cincinnati and northern Kentucky? And so the, and we had about 120 people in the room at that time. Uh, the answer was overwhelmingly yes. But then we uh, did something which looks like you guys are going to do today too. We wouldn't let anybody leave till they filled out an evaluation form. And on that evaluation form, we asked them a number of things, but one was, if you think this is something worth doing, are you willing to get personally involved and support it and become active in the effort? And happily enough, about 70% uh, of the people said yes, about 40% said they'd even be involved at a leadership level. So from there, we went on to form a core operating team to develop the concept. And um, uh, so then that has led to tremendous expansion. As Bobby said at our last summit, we had over 375 people. And uh, we now have, Green Umbrella has grown from being 10 organizations and 20 people, uh, individuals, to over 250 organizational members and over 100 or so uh, individual members. A budget of, uh, and we used to really be proud of this, because I've been involved with Green Umbrella since it started. Um, we were really proud of the fact that we could keep 7,000 bucks in the bank every year. You know, we do the little things we were doing, we keep working hard, we'd end the year with $7,000 and we'd think, okay, we're still not broke, so we can do this again next year. Which is why, uh, and, and I'd gotten a bit out of the loop when I took this job, and which is why they came to uh, apply for the grant. They wanted to get a capacity building grant, pick up some traction. So as it turns out, they picked up a lot of traction. And um, so we've now had a number of um, um, summits, and I want to talk in a minute about structure, but let me jump over for a minute to collective impact, because Bobby did a great job of setting up collective impact, explaining what it is, how you do it, uh, and I want to talk briefly about its role in the creation of Green Umbrella, but also some of the things that if you're going to be applying collective impact in your efforts, some things to watch out for. The um, uh, how it related to Green Umbrella. The fellow who was taking the lead on the app grant application was a fellow named Bill Hopple. Wonderful, wonderful guy, runs the uh, Cincinnati Nature Center. And um, he really took collective impact to heart. So as we developed the organization, we put those principles up on the board and said, okay, everything we do is gonna be focused through this lens of collective impact. And we joke about the fact that Bill became the, the collective impact hall monitor. He does a great job of when you start to drift off, brings you back to the to the focus and um, so that was an instrumental in getting green umbrella umbrella belt built but we have also used that in other ways uh, green umbrella has um, uh, is considered at this point a backbone organization for sustainability practices vision 2015 was also instrumental in developing another such organization called the northern kentucky education council in which we brought all of our school systems and the university and the college and the community college and a bunch of other partners who are all working like this, bringing them into the same room, the same framework, they established common goals that they agreed upon, and are now moving the needle a lot faster because they're working together in that collective impact approach. But here are a couple of things to look out for as you do it. First of all, the, you have to take things in sequence. The first thing is common agenda, and that means getting really specific about what the goals are. What is your common agenda? What are we actually specifically wanting to get done? Because it's very easy for people to talk in sort of generalities and say, boy, we really want to push uh, sustainability or we really want to make education better. That's just not going to take any place. You've got to get down to the point where you say, we want to make these specific measurable improvements. And once you can all agree on that, then you're in pretty good shape. Here's the biggest downfall, I think particularly in something like sustainability. People love to get involved in the um, activities, and they want to jump into the activities before they work out the structure, the data structure. Whatever you do, don't do that. Work out the data that you're going to need, what you're going to measure, how it's going to be measured, who's doing it, who's responsible, how they are held accountable. Because Green Umbrella itself continues to slide away. So we formed a data team to hold their feet to the fire, to, to really keep them focused on the data. So then everything else that, that Bobby mentioned is, is all part of the package. You really work together to drive this common agenda. I'd like to wrap up with just two comments. Number one, our next um, summit is coming up on May 1st of 2015. So we'd love to have all of you come to it. Uh, you can find information about it on the website for Green Umbrella, which is www, naturally, uh, greenumbrella.org. So greenumbrella, one word, dot org. 
also they've got a really good newsletter that goes out um, very, very frequently. Um, and it pulls together lots of information about all the action teams. Grin Umbrella, by the way, has eight action teams, and they're the similar ones that you guys are working on. And um, gives you up to date on that, how you can get involved, where you can go, who's doing what, all sorts of continuous communication and mutually reinforcing activities. So greenumbrella.org, and then the newsletter, you can subscribe to it, and I urge you to do that. Um, Green Umbrella, let me make sure I got this right. Uh, Green News, one word, Green News, at greenumbrella.org. So, uh, please check us out online, sign up, come to the summit, and we look forward to working with you all in the future. Is this your phone? Oh, yes it is. I knew I walked off and leave this there. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, I think you're starting to get a feel of kind of where we're going with uh, with this program today. Uh, now it gives me pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Blaine Early and then Cindy Dietz will follow him uh, for Empower Lexington and uh, Cindy will talk about the LFCUG um, Green Infrastructure Master Plan. Blaine. Thanks, Bobby, and thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, my firm, Stites and Harbison, has been a longtime supporter of Bluegrass Tomorrow, and it's our privilege to be here with you today. Uh, I'm going to talk about this Empower Lexington program, which, following the Green Umbrella and the Sustainability Council in Louisville, I think shows that, that we're, we're taking baby steps here in Lexington to have this kind of collaborative approach. Next slide, please. This, was a, this, this process started with a community grassroots origin from a group called Lex Cool City Associated or Concerned About Climate Change Actions, uh, Sierra Club and other kinds of community and citizen advocacy groups. Uh, then Mayor Jim Newberry signed the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors Climate Challenge in 2005. And then a, a large community effort started uh, involving representatives from LFUCG. For those of you who are outside this area, that's the Lexington Fayette County Urban Government, the combined city county government here and uh, a variety of businesses, trade organizations, and so forth. And I just want to take just a second. I didn't know I was going to do this, but, but Tom Webb from LFUCG was one of the principal contacts. His colleague, Jada Griggs, is here. If you two would stand up, please. Uh, again, these were very, very pivotal people in, in the effort. So th thank you very much for your work. <laughs> and also, if, if you were involved in any of the empower Lexington either steering committee central committee or, or focus group meetings would you just raise your hand real quickly because I've seen several of you here it was a big big effort throughout years literally years next slide please and what we did was to begin we, we didn't want to recreate the wheel looked at plans from uh, various communities in terms of climate change environmental quality energy efficiency resource use reduction, all these kinds of things from a variety of different organizations. And about the same time, the Brookings Institute came out with their uh, analysis of carbon footprints of various communities. If, if many, any of you remember that headline in the Herald Leader where Lexington had the worst carbon footprint of any city in our area. That, yeah, that's debatable, but, but still, it, kind of, it was a wake-up call. What's going on here, folks? We held a, a number of different meetings and then, again, key Bill, I appreciate you talking about the data. Key was, well, what's our, what's our status? What is our real energy impact? What's our real carbon footprint? And so a major component of this, with the help of utilities, electric utilities, natural gas, and then the staff at LFUCG using computer modeling uh, with, with specific kinds of protocols to develop a, an, an emissions inventory based on things like vehicle miles traveled, kilowatt hours of electricity use, MCF of, of natural gas, and so forth. Had a variety of public meetings to get public input, and then worked up a plan involving uh, five major sectors, and, and after much discussion, what appears to be kind of a, kind of a, uh, uh, maybe a low bar to set, but the goal of reducing energy use and reducing carbon emissions, carbon equivalent emissions, by 1% each year, measured both on a total basis and then on a per capita basis as well. And we'll talk about the results when I, when I get finished. Here we looked at these five different, different areas, not, not because there's anything magical about them or not because it was um, 
necessarily the best way to gather information, but it seemed to fit a lot of the different community interests, a lot of the people who were doing these kinds of resource use, energy reduction use kinds of activities. Next slide. And, and uh, the, the specific objectives and the major goals are listed. There's a two-page front and back handout on the, one of the back tables, so if you're interested in this, I encourage you to pick up one of those. But, but the five areas, in, in many cases, focused on uh, educational outreach to get the information out because there are, there are some very simple things like, like turning off the lights, like switching out light bulbs and so forth. But on the residential sector, again, the primary goal here, again, outreach. Teach people about how to do energy efficient things in their homes. Next. In transportation, uh, that's not something necessarily that, that nonprofit groups can do. That comes largely from state cab uh, transportation cabinet and from metropolitan planning, regional planning. But, but to reach out to increase use of public transportation, reduce vehicle miles traveled, to make transportation more people friendly. Next. For the combined institutional industrial commercial grouping, everything from factories, and for example, Mr. Johnson from Link Belt is here, to the uh, Fayette County Public Schools, one of our very big institutional partners, and all those businesses in between. Again, largely outreach here, trying to get people with the desire to increase energy efficiency together with the tools and the resources to do that. Next slide. On the land use, food and agriculture, uh, as Bobby mentioned as we started, that preserving our bluegrass soils, and, and not just preservation, but to use those soils wisely, to uh, increase the use of riparian buffers, to increase the learned use of green space that Cindy Dietz is gonna talk about in a second, and, and knowing that land has to pay for itself to increase our food production and the ability to, for people to know where their food is coming from locally. Next. On the waste side, a very ambitious goal to, uh, have to move us toward actually a zero waste policy. Next. Some of the data that come from this, uh, looking at, at 2007 as a benchmark, uh, the, the next year's data that we have in total is 2011. You can see here we had an enormous reduction in, the, in both energy use overall and the per capita energy use. We are now, again, with the help of the folks at LFUCG, looking at data for 2012 and 2013, and hope to be able to report those very soon. Next slide. What's next? Again, trying to bring people together, trying to uh, have this kind of concerted effort, th this impact, this common impact. And then if you look at carbon dioxide emissions, energy use, so where does land use fit into that? Well, land use is, is again, it, it has many, many components for, uh, next slide, please. Many uses in terms of improving environmental quality. Next slide, please. And Cindy Dietz is going to talk to you about that and some very, very exciting things that are coming from out of our uh, comprehensive plan revisions and what we can look forward to in the future. Again, please pick up one of the information sheets on the back. Thank you. So we've been building trails and protecting our trees, planting trees, uh, and in the 2013 comprehensive plan, uh, we are talking a, a lot about sustainable neighborhood design and community development that maintains that urban edge. And uh, long before we start talking about sustainability, Lexington in 1958 was the first city in the United States to have an urban service boundary and that was to be able to protect our agricultural industry and those vital prime soils. So then in 1994 we had a green space plan adopted and our definition of green space is very broad. It, it's quite different from other cities in that we decide that um, green space is all of the physical characteristics that make up our bluegrass identity. So this is really, really broad. Uh, it, it ranges from just the typical parks that you think of green space, but also our rural working lands. Um, it, it's rural roads and urban boulevards. It's our rural settlements, and it's also neighborhoods in the urban service area. So 
in 2007, that comprehensive plan, we did another major leap forward and we introduced the concept of green infrastructure. And I like to think of this as green space on steroids. It's, uh, you, you may have heard of green infrastructure before, but probably the engineering definition, which is just strictly about stormwater. But in planning circles, uh, it's anything that's green that a community values. And so with us, as in 1958, our agricultural soils, and then in 1994 with our green space plan, talking about those essential characteristics that are, are uh, for our bluegrass identity, um, our definition then of green infrastructure is that it's the, the landscapes and the natural resources that are fundamental to the environmental health and the health of the citizens of, of Lexington. So what makes this different than, uh, than just regular green space? I'm hoping we're going to be able to keep that green infrastructure uh, definition instead of thinking of the engineering one because it's so important to have the term infrastructure in there because it's, it's elevating green space and our natural resources from just being an amenity to something that is actually uh, a necessity, just like our roads and our sewers with gray infrastructure. And then also it's a whole different way of looking at uh, the approach of how we do our decision making for green space and natural resources because it's looking at the interrelationships between the environmental, the social, and the economic uh, systems. In other words, the triple bottom line. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on these slides, but just to show you that there are a list of different benefits, we call them services now, um, that green infrastructure provides. And these, these are all very important for us to be considering every time that we, we do uh, management and planning for green infrastructure. So here are the ecological services, uh, and, I'm sorry, environmental and economic and the uh, community services. And here's the uh, principles for green infrastructure out of the 2007 comprehensive plan. Um, so if we want to protect our natural resources and our landscapes, if we want to maximize those services uh, and move towards a sustainable uh, community that's based on these principles, then we have to have a real paradigm shift on, on how we, how we uh, do things. So the 2013 comprehensive plan is called for um, a green infrastructure master plan to be developed. And these are some of the strategies that are taken from other uh, communities that have a plan already. And as you can see, they've got uh, multiple scales, like a lot of what we're talking about here today, that it's obviously uh, natural resources and systems and cultural landscapes don't stop at political boundaries um, and at the bottom you know it garner support you know this isn't going to just be something that lfucg does but uh going to have to have partnerships throughout and here's some uh, uh just a basic list of, of ones that we've already thought about of, of people that might possibly be involved so we're hoping that um we can get this integrated throughout government. Um, like I said, it's a real paradigm shift for us in thinking how we're going to be doing our thinking. But it, if it's all based on doing these triple bottom line assessments that we're going to be able to have better um, accountability, uh, efficiency, and how we uh, do our funding allocations and accomplishing the goals towards a more sustainable community. Thank you, Blaine and Cindy. Uh, it gives me a good, good pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Tracine Logston at uh, Bluegrass Youth Sustainability Council. I'm proud that my daughter Amelia is uh, part of this uh, exciting group doing some cool things in schools throughout Fayette County. Uh, unfortunately, she had a test that starts in about 30 minutes and couldn't be here uh, today. Uh, so with that, uh, Tracine, come on up. And uh, Florence, uh, she has the video uh, as well after a slide or two. 
You want to check the video real quick? Just to come on up. <laughs>